Now let's talk about an actual attack, like the one happening in Russia. The Belgorod region has been under attack since yesterday. This is a region in Russia that borders Ukraine. Some fighters hit multiple villages in the area. Several drones struck Belgorod overnight. The fighting is ongoing. And who's behind this offensive? A group calling themselves the Liberty of Russia Legion has taken responsibility. We are Russians just like you. We are people just like you. We want our children to grow up in peace and be free people so they can travel, study and just be happy in a free country. But this has no place in today's Putin's Russia, rotten from corruption, lies, censorship, restrictions on freedoms, repressions. In that Russia where a person's life means less than an official's wallet. The fighters say they are Russians. They claim to have liberated a village in the Belgorod region and that they're moving towards the town of Grave Oron. Reports say there's one more group involved in the fighting. It's called the Russian Volunteer Corps. And the question is, why are Russians fighting against their own country? Apparently to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Listen to this. It's time to put an end to the Kremlin's dictatorship, thanks to all those who support us, to everyone who sends us donations and smokes where necessary. Your support is what every day reminds us of our final goal on Red Square. Be brave and don't be afraid, because we are coming home. Russia will be free. These groups say they want to bring about regime change in Moscow. The Kremlin says that's a lie, that these attackers are in fact Ukrainian saboteurs. I am now in the Graveron district. The situation here continues to be extremely tense. A sabotage reconnaissance group entered the territory. The Ministry of Defense and all law enforcement agencies are fulfilling their assigned combat tasks to protect our country. The current situation is that eight people were injured. According to information from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Defense, there were no civilian casualties. Once again, the situation is tense and remains so. A counter-terrorist operation was declared. Many restrictions are in place. That was from yesterday. Russia declared a counter-terrorism operation. It also accused Ukraine of staging the attack on Belgorod as a diversion. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov says, and I'm quoting, we perfectly understand the purpose of such sabotage to divert attention from the Bakhmut direction to minimize the political effect of the loss of Bakhmut by the Ukrainian side. Ukraine, of course, has denied all of this. This is what an advisor to Zelensky posted yesterday. He said Ukraine has no direct involvement in the attacks on, on Belgorod or any of the attacks in the Russian territory. Kiev maintains that all such attacks in Russians, on Russian soil have been conducted by dissidents by groups like the Liberty of Russia Legion. But of course, Kiev has to say that. You see, all the weapons that Ukraine gets from its Western allies come with a clause. They can only be used for defense. They can't be used to attack Russia. But the fact is, there are boots on the ground in Russian territory. They've openly attacked multiple villages in Russia. It marks another stage in the war of attacks inside Russia. We'll have to wait and see how Moscow responds. For our next story, I want you to look at this picture. What do you see? A cloud of smoke rising up, a building in the background. It looks like an explosion or an attack. Well, that isn't any building. That's the Pentagon. It's the headquarters of the US Department of Defense. But there's a catch. There wasn't any explosion at the Pentagon yesterday. What you're looking at is a fake. It was generated by artificial intelligence or AI. Some verified Twitter handles ended up posting this picture. Thanks to Elon Musk, anybody can now be verified, including this account. It says Bloomberg feed with a blue tick. Now, Bloomberg, we know, is one of the biggest media organizations in the US. But this account was not theirs. It belonged to some mischief maker, some random person. Many journalists and channels actually fell for this fake image. Funny, right? Well, here the other side of the story. This image caused the U.S. stock market to dip. Standard & Poor dropped 0.26% within minutes. It only recovered once the story was busted. What do we make of this incident? The blue tick is one part of the problem. Unfortunately, Twitter is now owned by just one man, so there is little that governments or people can do. But artificial intelligence is not. It is still uncharted territory. 
So there is still time to put regulations in place. This Pentagon fake is just one example of how dangerous AI can be. The White House could be next, or India's Rashtrapati Bhavan, or the Parliament, or the, the International Space Station, who knows. Artificial intelligence can manipulate almost anything, and the consequence could be huge. In this case, U.S. stocks dropped by a quarter of a percent. Next time, it could be worse. So what's the solution? If you don't have fancy technology, your options are limited. You can check for watermarks or even try to find out AI anomalies, like extra limbs on human beings or lack of facial features. These will tell you if an image is fake or not. But what if the AI is really advanced? In such cases, there may not be even a single anomaly. So here's what you should do. Check for other reports or pictures of the same event. Take this Pentagon example. If there was indeed a blast, there would be dozens of videos, different angles, different commentary, different sources. But that was not the case here. In this case, there was only one single photo posted everywhere, which is a classic giveaway. So keep this tip in mind next time you see a suspicious news photo. Now to the bigger problem. How to avoid such controversies in the first place. Looks like regulation is the only answer because artificial intelligence is getting more powerful every day. Let me give you an example. Take a look at this photo of the Pope in a puffer jacket. It's generated by AI, but the folks at Sony could not figure it out. This picture won an award at a global photography event. Its creator says it was a joke. He also ended up rejecting the award. Tells you how realistic AI images are. Even experts are having a hard time picking them out. So what should big tech and governments be doing? In simple words, slow down. Right now, the technology is racing ahead of the regulation. In fact, there are barely any rules in place. So the first step is to set the guidelines because artificial intelligence is like the Wild West. It's exciting, it's impending, and it's dangerous. If we do not regulate it, the next fake could be worse. Maybe AI phone calls by world leaders or AI addresses by generals or AI threats by terrorists. If you want to avoid that mess, slow down. Let the regulations catch up. The red ceiling has kept Biden occupied. He was supposed to be in Papua New Guinea on Monday. Instead, he was back in Washington. Biden sent his top diplomat in his place. That's Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Blinken had two jobs in Papua New Guinea. A, make up for Biden's absence, and B, close a security agreement. We're focusing on that second one, the U.S.-Papua New Guinea security agreement. It was signed in Port Moresby on Monday. Here's how, how Blinken described it. Under this agreement, our forces will be able to board one another's vessels, share technical expertise, and ultimately, better patrol the seas together, which is vital to protecting livelihoods for generations to come. The agreement will also make it easier for PNG and U.S. forces to train together in new ways and in more places as part of our joint effort to uphold peace and security across the Indo-Pacific. We will be fully transparent. The full text of this agreement has not been released, so naturally there are questions. Students in some universities also staged protests. They say the Pacific is being militarized. To make matters worse, a leaked draft is being circulated. What does it say? Three major things. One, legal immunity for U.S. soldiers and contractors. Two, free movement for U.S. ships and airplanes. And three, no migration requirements for U.S. staff. Objectively, that's a lot. But like I said, this is a leaked draft. It's better to wait for the final copy of the agreement to emerge. So let's focus on the confirmed details in the meantime. The U.S. has promised aid worth $45 million. This will be used for security upgradation, climate action and public health. Blinken says there is nothing to worry, that this deal is just another step in a long-standing relationship. But not many in Papua New Guinea are convinced. So now their prime minister has stepped in. Here's what he said, and I'm quoting. It is not a military base to be set up here for war to be launched. There's a specific clause that says that this partnership is not a partnership for PNG to be used as a place for launching offensive military operations. The Prime Minister is worried about China. They are Papua New Guinea's second largest trading partner, first if you count just the merchandise. So the Prime Minister cannot afford to antagonize Beijing. He needs Chinese trade, investments and loans. What he doesn't need is a Chinese debt trap. So what does he do? Sign a security agreement with the United States. 
Like, like I said, we don't know what the details of the agreement are, but it will increase U.S. presence on the island, that's for sure. It will expand U.S. access to military bases. The question is, how will China respond to all of this? To be honest, they made the first move. In 2022, China signed a security deal with the Solomon Islands. The U.S. was caught off guard. The Pacific was supposed to be their backyard, yet the Chinese managed to score a deal. But then, Beijing made a rookie error. They tried to overplay their hand. How? By trying to see, sign a security pact with all Pacific islands. That attempt was promptly rejected. It also poked the U.S. into action. Biden first hosted a summit of Pacific leaders at the White House. Now he's got a security deal with Papua New Guinea. What does he want next? Ideally, total control over the Pacific. This region is important for a number of reasons. A. The sheer size. The Pacific makes up around 20% of the Earth's total area, also 28% of all exclusive economic zones. B. The location. It's right in between the US, China and Australia. If you have a base there, it could be a game changer. You can spy on ships going from Australia to the US. You can deploy assets to the South China Sea. Plus, you can control a major trading route. And that's reason number three. The resources, mainly fish. The Pacific is by far the most fertile fishing ground in the world. It exports more than 530,000 metric tons of seafood. Guess who's interested in this trade? The Chinese. Their Pacific fishing fleet has grown by 500% since 2012. 500% growth. If you control the Pacific, you control the fishing. China, with 1.4 billion people to feed, needs it. And reason number four political and military dominance. The Pacific Islands may be tiny, but they control vast amounts of the ocean. They are 55 times more water than landmass, which means they are a front line. In a battle between Asia and North America, the Pacific will play a key role. It has happened before. During the Second World War, Japan and the US fought for the Pacific. The US won and went on to dominate the region. The question is, will there be a repeat? The people here certainly don't want it, including those in Papua New Guinea. PNG is the biggest Pacific island if you exclude Australia. It is home to some 9 million people. Their priority is not big power rivalries. They want jobs. They want better infrastructure. They want climate action. The Pacific islands are the most vulnerable to climate change. If the oceans rise, they lose land. If the typhoons are supercharged, they lose houses. So the Pacific islands want funds to tackle that. But who's willing to listen? China just wants the resources and military bases. The US just wants to drive out China. Caught in the middle are the people of the Pacific. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with India. The Natu Natu fever has reached the G20 summit, the meeting happening in Kashmir. Actor Ram Charan made delegates dance to the song. In England, water buffaloes took a dip in a new private swimming pool in Essex. The owners of the pool have sought compensation. They say the animals have ruined... Their pool worth over $80,000. And in Guatemala, some cliff divers took their skill and love for adventure to a new height. And finally, what makes this day, the 23rd of May, significant? We are taking you back in history on this day in 1915. Italy declared war on Austria and Hungary. And with that, Rome entered the world war on the side of the original allies, Britain, France, Russia. Initially, when the war broke out in 1914, Italy chose to be neutral in the conflict. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching.
exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defence minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colony. US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.